Welcome back to Eat Train Talks, everyone. And today I am thrilled to be talking with author and biologist Jay Hosler. And if I'm going to introduce him right, it's Dr. Jay Hosler, the author and illustrator of really cool and informative science oriented comics and graphic novels. I read Jay's novel, Evolution The Story of Life on Earth, about a year ago after my mom came across it and thought it looked like a book that I would enjoy. And she was right. And just recently, I've also read Jay's incredibly fascinating graphic novel, The Way of the Hive, a honeybee story. Finding a read that you enjoy is one thing, but digging into a book that not only entertains you, but ends up teaching you about science and keeps you captivated, and you learn about all things evolution, honeybees, insects, that's the reason I love Jay's books because they check all the boxes. Jay is a professor, a TED talker, a bee enthusiast, and an entomologist. And he's also an author, as I've said, and he writes amazing books that you need to read. So without further ado, I'm really, really excited to introduce Jay Hosler. Woo. Well, thank you. Hooray! <laughs> yeah, Jay is the best. His books are the best, and his TED Talks, well, his TED Talk, it was really informative, and I learned a lot about why science comics can change the world. We'll get to that later on in the video. And I just gotta say, I love your writing. To take a complex scientific subject and to be able to create fun, entertaining, and informative books that middle graders and all ages enjoy is quite a feat. And I'm sure everyone listening is curious to know where the inspiration for you to begin your writing journey came from. Yeah, so that's, uh, you know, it's a really good question. Um, I think that it started with peanuts, right? Charlie Brown. Oh, yeah. Yeah, not peanuts that you eat. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would be an interesting starting point. Um, yeah, you know, uh, when I was growing up, my, my grandmother had a little lake cottage in northern Indiana, and we would go up there in the summer times. And she just had a couple books. Um, uh, and one of them was this treasury edition by Charles Schultz all these old peanuts and i'll tell you what between swimming and and fishing and canoeing i had that book in my hands and i was i guess even at that young age and i don't know that i could have articulated it at the time but i think even then what i was really struck by was how much sort of emotional power um and depth of of feeling and thought you know charles schultz could uh, imbue uh, such simple drawings, right? And he could do it with such little text. And I, I guess I spent a lot of time just staring at how he did that. And I think that was sort of the seed that got planted. That was the seed that made me think, ah, uh, you know, I want to try to do something like that. I want to try to capture that uh, sense of um, excitement uh, and and, and meaning, right? I mean, the thing is about uh, Charles Schultz's work in, in Charlie Brown is that, you know, they were oftentimes just very funny, but sometimes they're very poignant, you know, and sometimes they're kind of sad. And, you know, to have that sort of range of emotion um, in such a limited space of four panels, that made me want to write. I'm pretty sure that was it. Well, you certainly seem like a smart kid because... I don't know if, like, until now, I don't think I'd ever read the Peanuts and really think for that long about how Charles Schultz just writes, like, like with his drawings, he really tells a story in just four panels. Like, I've never really thought about that. But now I have to read the Peanuts again and watch the movies to see what differs and all that. So, yeah, I mean, I think that the thing, the thing that is so great about his work is that, um, it, it's so easy to read, right? It flows into your head. It's it's effortless, and you don't as a as a result. Sometimes you don't really think about it in terms of the fact that all the work that he had to do to make it just slide right into your brain. Besides peanuts, what was your go to comic, or did you have multiple? No, no, that's uh, that's a fun question too, because I mean, it really was peanuts that got me into to reading these things, but. It was a trip uh, going across country. Uh, it was our family trip out west from Indiana. We went out to Wyoming 
And along the way, we stopped at a drugstore and they, they had a, one of those classic old spinner racks of comics. I don't know, you don't really see them in stores much anymore. They used to be everywhere. And, you know, my parents were both teachers. And so I said, well, you know, here's a comic. And I'd never really read a comic before. I'm like, here's a comic. It's like reading, mom and dad. Could, could I have this comic? And the comic on the cover had um, Spider-Man and Kazar. Kazar is sort of Marvel Comics Tarzan. And they were fighting Stegron the Dinosaur Man. Because one of the places we were going was Dinosaur National Monument, because I loved the dinosaurs. So I got this and, and you know, immediately fell in love with the, the art format, right? So in, unlike uh, Peanuts, which had was sort of restricted to four panels or maybe, you know, nine or 10 if it was a Sunday strip, here were pages and pages and pages of story and sequential art. And, and it was drawn by an artist named Gil Kane, who was a masterful illustrator. And so you know, interesting layouts, uh, visually displaying sort of the story. And through through Spider-Man, so I, I really liked Spider-Man, but through Spider-Man, I met Peter Parker, right? Here's this skinny kid that wears glasses. He's into science. Nobody likes him. He was just like me. And so I really, he became sort of my, my go-to character to follow, even more so than Spider-Man. So he sort of sucked me into Spider-Man comics. And that was, that was the main comic I read for a very, very long time. Well, Spider-Man, Spider-Man does whatever Spider-Man can. And he <laughs> inspires Jay Hosler to write comics. He did. And I'm just, I guess I have to say that I'm thankful to the artist who did all the Spider-Mans or the artists yeah. Um, because they inspired you to write your incredible comics. And that sounds like such a fun story. Like you're on your way to Na Dinosaur National Monument. You yep. stop at a drugstore and at a drugstore, you find out why just like your purpose, like to, well, besides being a biologist and a scientist and a teacher and all the other things you do to be an author of graphic novels. Yeah, I think it's an it's an interesting way of putting it. You you find inspiration, you find your path nudged uh, in some of the strangest places. You know, a a drugstore on the road toward the west, uh, and it can happen anywhere, right? So I've got students who get inspired when they're walking across campus and see something or other. I mean, it can happen anywhere, and it does make our stories sort of fun in retrospect. Yeah, they definitely do. And um, do you draw your own book illustrations or does someone else contribute to the images? Yeah, so um, I typically, I think the Evolution is the only book that I haven't drawn. That was drawn by Kevin Cannon and Xander Cannon and they're good friends and they are absolutely bonkers good at what <laughs> they do. Um, but every other book I've done, I've illustrated. Uh, and for me, the illustration part is the is the most fun part, right? The I mean, writing is fun, uh, but it feels challenging in a way that art, well, at least for me, doesn't, um, uh, you know, so, um, so yeah, I do most, I do almost all of my illustrations. Wow. And I was really curious because I read The Way of the Hive, mm -hmm. and I read Evolution, the Story of Life on Earth, and the illustrations were all, like, they really differed between the two. So I was kind of curious to know if you did all the illustrations. And I've got to say, the illustrations to Kev that Kevin Cannon and Xander Cannon did were amazing. But they were the way of the hive that just struck me. Like, like your drawings, they were so detailed. Like, and you really complemented your drawings with your writing. And I know that it, writing is really difficult, but you really did an amazing job at it. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I think that this is uh, this is an interesting observation, right? So. Um, I think um, when I'm when I'm writing um, a story, uh, you know, I start. I'm typing away. I'm writing a script or whatever. I'm imagining uh, what the page will look like in my head right then, mm -hmm. and that actually affects how I write yeah. uh, something or other. Uh, when you when you work with an artist, and there are tremendous teams up there, but when you work with an artist, they're going to have their own vision. Uh, for what they see there and you want them to you want them to do their own thing so it feels like a good collaboration but it's always going to be slightly different 
uh, may be very different from what you imagine. So, uh, so when I get to write and draw my own stuff, I feel like I get to synthesize it a lot more because typically my process involves, you know, writing and then I'll draw some thumbnails about what I'm going to do, how it's going to look. And once I start doing that, I think, oh, wow, that's, uh, that's not going to work. And it, it makes me go back to the script, change the script a little bit, then go back to the thumbnails. And once I feel like I've got the thumbnails close and I start drawing it, and I'll draw it and I'll think, oh, I didn't even think about this. I have to change the script this way. So there's this point when you're between writing and finishing the artwork on the page, when you're constantly feeding back on what you do and constantly shaping it. So in the end, I usually get a final page that sometimes looks close to what I wrote originally wrote. Sometimes it's a little bit different, sometimes a lot different. Um, and that doesn't happen as much when you know it's a separate writer and a separate artist because you know you gotta you gotta write it and get it to a point where the artist can work and then you don't want to change it too much on them after that so yeah I think that you know it's interesting that there there are very different sort of um, dynamics and sort of the creation of a page yeah and I was actually just gonna ask like what is the process for writing than drawing a graphic novel and you just read my mind I'm <laughs> That's just so interesting. And the variations between like another illustrator or you being the illustrator and the writer. So like all the little kinks and errors you have to fix. It's just, I never really realized that there were so many hidden details, so much going on behind the scenes until like my podcast. So I always find it really intriguing, like talking to illustrators, because I want to know, like, whoa, how do you kind of complement your writing with your drawings? How do you like what's the script like? Do you have your own script or do you just have the drawings and write into the drawing? So I just find it really fascinating. So thanks for reading my mind and being. Yeah, so it's interesting. And what's really interesting is that so many people do it differently. I have friends who don't write a script first they have sort of a, a an idea of a plot and then they'll just start drawing and that is when they sort of put together the script and it can be very organic and in that way can work too it's just sort of the way your brain works i think yeah it definitely is the way your brain works and so here's something i bet most of you listening don't know jay hosted a ted talk titled science comics can save the world which i watched and I have to say, it's so inspiring. Your talk was really informative. You are very articulate. And I could certainly see that you're prepared for a while. And when I grow up, one of my dreams is to host a TED Talk. So I was really thrilled to stumble upon this bit of information about you. And okay, now back to the question. Will you share what the whole TED experience was like? Were you nervous? Or were you kind of determined to share the truth than anything else? Yeah, so... So it was a really interesting experience. So um, the way it worked was this was a TEDx talk. And so it was sort of a franchise talk at Junietta College where I work. And it was um, that there were students on campus that wanted to do this. And they managed to get approval from the TED organization to do this TEDx. And it was really interesting. You're right in terms of preparation, probably a lot more preparation went into that talk that I did than any other talk that I've ever given. Because what happens is they say, well, okay, uh, here's, here, here's your time. You've got, you've got 18 minutes. Don't go over that. Don't go over 18 minutes. And they really, they impressed that upon you. I did go over a little bit. They didn't shoot me or anything. So that was good. But the, the idea that um, I had this limited frame of time to work within. And then once you, once you write it all up, you have to send it to some folks and they have to read through it, make sure it's okay. And then they may give you feedback and you edit it. And then a couple nights before you go into the studio where it's held and you practice. And I don't know if you've ever noticed that Ted has that great big red dot rug on the floor. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the next time you watch a Ted talk, if you can see their feet, you'll notice there's a big red dot and you're supposed to stand on that dot and not move around much and look at the camera. And I am very much a move aroundy kind of person. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah, and so 
So I tried really hard and I, I wound up pivoting quite a bit, which I think I probably pivoted way too much. But the other thing is too, that I, to, to stay within the time guidelines, I sort of had to get close to memorizing my talk, which is not actually something I do very often either. In the end, I thought it worked you know, pretty well, but you're right. Uh, being back, the way it worked was they filmed several different TED Talks all at once. And I think I was near the end. And so I sat through everybody else's TED Talks and that did not relax me because there were a lot of really good people before me. And I thought, oh my goodness, there's a lot of pressure. Yeah. <laughs> so, but in the end, it was, it was a lot of fun, but a lot of preparation. Yeah. It sounds like you're writing a book. You had a script, you had an editor. It's <laughs> yeah. a lot like a book. It is. You know, it really was sort of what my students go through when they write a paper for me. I had to write a paper for somebody else. They gave me feedback. And then I had to practice my presentation. And so it, it, had, it had the effect of helping me understand sort of or remember, because I've done it before, but it was a long time ago. Remember what it feels like to have to write a paper for somebody else and have to perform for somebody else. Yeah, so you were like the student who became the master. And then when you had to do a TED Talk, you were the master who became the student again. Yeah, I don't know that I've, I've quite reached master status yet, <laughs> but I definitely was... I definitely did feel a, a big role reversal. Mm -hmm. And from the pivot thing, I would have pivoted like the entire time. You probably couldn't even hear me in the camera because I'd be pivoting like, oh, if we look at the screen over here, oh, right. and, and like I just pivot over here. Like I I had no idea you had to stay in just one place. Now I'm not sure if I want to, if I'm okay, <laughs> well, you I'm, can I'm do ready it. to do one. You can do it. Now what they do is they, your slides are projected behind you, but they also project the slides in front of you. So oh. you can look straight ahead at the camera and see your slides and talk about the slides and know that they're back there. Wow, that's really interesting. And it's pretty cool to hear the behind the scenes, what goes on from yeah. a professional TED talker. Well, I would, <laughs> yeah, professional. I'll take and, that. And I'm, so I asked about what inspired you to become an author and illustrator, but what made you decide to pursue a career in biology? Did something about the topic sort of click with you from a young age, or did you discover your love for science later? Yeah, so that's, um, you know, I, I grew up when I was, the, 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 the first passion I remember feeling was about dinosaurs. I mean, I love dinosaurs. Um, and I, I still have all my, my mom sent, my mom and dad sent me my old uh, dinosaur books the other day. And there's one, uh, it was a National Geographic book. And if you flip it over, you can see all these lines dug into the cover because I would use this as a drawing board, right? I put a piece of paper on it and I would draw dinosaurs on it. So from a very early age, that was, that was what I was interested in, dinosaurs. And I was interested in them in terms of them being animals, right? Um, I didn't really want to be a paleontologist. Yeah. No, that, that wasn't exactly for me. Um, and so I was in sort of into biology, dinosaurs pulled me into it. And then uh, when I, I think I was in the eighth grade, it was when I first saw Carl Sagan's uh, Cosmos series, oh, yeah. which was on PBS, right? And Neil deGrasse Titan has actually done a second mm -hmm. Cosmos. Um, but there was an episode that Sagan did uh, about evolution. And in it, you know, the story of evolution was super cool just to begin with. I thought it was really cool. But then he, he started speculating on what animals on other planets would look like. What might a, an animal on Jupiter look like, a gas giant? And thinking about you know the bizarre sort of possibilities, I found really exciting. And then I think it was that same year, I sort of sort of noticing bugs, right? I started noticing that, wow, these things are these things are like aliens right here on the planet, right? These weird yeah. crawly little things. They're very different from us, right? We have four legs. They have six. Our skeletons on the inside, their skeletons on the outside. They can fly. We can't. Um, and so to me, all of a sudden that, you know, thinking about cool aliens on other planets, I realized I could start thinking about cool aliens right here on Earth. So that's sort of the path that took me into my interest in insects. Yeah, and then you became an entomologist. I did. 
And speaking of entomology, what would happen if there weren't any bugs, any insects on Earth? If all the bees died out, the, the pollinators were gone, there were no more cockroaches or flies, what would the Earth be like? Well, I mean, when you think about what insects are, I mean, there are more species of insects. Well, actually, there's more species of just beetles than there are species of lizards, birds, and probably mammals. The, the mass, if you took every ant and piled it on top of each other in one great big pile, and you did the same thing for humans, they would weigh way more than Whoa. we do. I know, way more. And so insects um, are abundant and everywhere. And the things they do are pretty important. So for example, they we know that they pollinate, right? Yeah. So without pollinators, I mean, we have we have bats and we have birds that can pollinate. Um, but if we took away all the insects, that would be almost, that would be the major pollinators. We'd still have those bats and birds for a little bit, but what do bats and birds eat? They eat insects. insects. So uh, if all the insects went away, then the birds, a lot of birds and a lot of bats would have nothing to eat. They'd probably go away too. Okay, well, there go most of our pollinators. You know, bugs and insects are really important for, uh, that's, that's the food end, right? There's the other end, we can call it the poop end. And you've got, you've got insects out there that are waste management, right? They're like dung beetles. They're scooping up poop and burying it, keeps the ground fertile. Um, and, you know, so they're taking care of things at the other end as well. And then just in general, things that they do, providing food for other organisms, um, it would be a devastating loss for life on earth. So in other words, I guess what I'm saying is if all the insects went away, we'd be in real trouble. But if all the people went away, the insects probably wouldn't notice. <laughs> That's true. And I've got to let my mom know because she's deathly afraid of quite a few insects. So I've got to let her know, don't step on them next time. Yeah, you know, scoop them up with some paper, put them in a plastic cup, toss them outside. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so now I'm a huge fan of graphic novels, and mm -hmm. I can't imagine a literary world without them. But there mm -hmm. are a lot of people who claim graphic novels aren't real books. Mm -hmm. They say they're read for silliness and not for serious readers. And I'm not sure many parents actually read graphic novels, because if they did, they would be surprised to see how much there is to learn. Yeah. And people in the book world definitely know how valuable graphic novels are. And can you share why graphic novels are so important? And just, well, real books? And also, how can we change the minds of all those parents? Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, there are two two important questions there. Why are they important and how do we change minds? And and one's easier than the other, I think. I mean, yeah. so th the question I have for folks who, who I have said this to me is, um, what is it that you actually want from a reader, mm -hmm. right? Um, so you don't like that this child is maybe reading a graphic novel, okay? Um, what would you prefer? Uh, you would prefer them to read a book without pictures, right? So a lot of the times they, they say, well, they make jokes. They go, well, you know, books with pictures. But I'll tell you what, I teach uh, biology and, uh, you know, my students use a textbook and guess what that textbook is filled with? It's pictures. filled with pictures, right? Every textbook is filled with pictures, lots of pictures, multiple pictures on any given page. Now, admittedly, the text is something that you have to master, but why do we have the pictures there? The pictures help us understand, right? They help draw us into whatever ideas are on the page. Graphic novels are the same, and, and it doesn't have to be like a science graphic novel. It can be just a graphic novel that is, you know, a literary piece of work. Images pull us into things. Images challenge us in terms of how we read them. I mean, there's, there are a lot of comics out there that have no text at all that are challenging to read because you have to understand uh, posture, gesture, inference, right? Yeah. So, so the question becomes for, for people like that, wh what is it you want? You want, you, you want you know, young kids reading Ulysses? Uh, probably not. 
right? What they'll say is, well, you have to learn how to read a text. And my answer to that is, you're not going to learn to read difficult text by starting with difficult text. And, and if somebody's not a reader, if someone's not a reader and you want them to be a reader, the best way to do that is to use images and use graphic novels. And there's, now that's one thing. On the other side, there's actually a lot of data now in papers that have shown that graphic novels help kids learn. Um, I actually published a paper with a colleague at Bucknell University, KB Boomer, that showed that you know, if you use a comic book uh, textbook that I created, uh, you actually wind up with kids who don't like science, liking science at the end. So they go in and think, oh, science is hard. I don't want to do it. They use this. They realize, oh, it's not so bad. And the comic helped. And there are a bunch of other articles out there that show that as well. So, you know, the, the, the weight of evidence from a literary standpoint and from a scientific standpoint that comics are, are useful and good and a nice thing to read and a good thing to read, it's pretty overwhelming. Definitely. And that's so true. That's there. There's so many brilliant aspects of graphic novels and comics alike. And I'm probably going to ask parents or people like that. Well, it's kind of my, my mom said it's rude to contradict some parents if they're not my parents, but <laughs> um, still, I would say, well, yeah, what do you want your kid to read? Do you want them to read a book? Well, I'm not going to be super, like, rude, but, like, do you want them to read War, Pe War and Peace or something? Like, they're... Uh, and you don't, yeah, I agree. You don't want to be rude, but you can ask questions. Yes. You can ask, um, why not, All right? So one of my favorite authors is uh, Terry Pratchett, mm -hmm. uh, who writes the Discworld books. And they are quite silly, quite funny, but he uses that silliness and funniness to make serious commentary on the world. And so, um, you know, it's, uh, it, it's something that comics can do and do very well. And I think, I think the whole thing of, I, I think the more anybody reads, the better. And so I have friends that read graphic novels and everybody who I know that reads graphic novels and comics reads a ton of other stuff as well. Do you happen to know why humans haven't yet been able to come up with a way to imitate how bees pollinate or butterflies or any pollinators? Uh, it's interesting because, you know, flowers are actually quite small, right? And um, there, are, there are workers, there are uh, industries in which people do go out and they will physically use a brush to pick up some pollen and to pollinate uh, a given flower. But the truth is, uh, bees and insects are like little bitty workers who crawl into a flower and dust it and put all this stuff on it. And it's very difficult to do that with a machine, right? That's a big true. machine. And so I think that that's one of those things that you know, we won't be able to do that until we have little nanobots flying around orchards. Yeah, I really agree with you. We need nanobots, that kind of stuff to imitate pollinating. And it's going to be a while. So we definitely need to save the bees, save our pollinators, because it's going to be many years before we can imitate them. And the I know that the populations of all these creatures are dwindling because of climate change, also because of us. So we need to really step up our, I guess, empathy for nature, and we need to do something about it. Because we can't pollinate all these plants, not yet anyway. Yeah. And I don't think we ever want to. I think that we'll be yeah. a better place if we if we all just sort of share the planet and we let each other do the things we do. If you could be any insect or bug, what would it be and why? Oh, that's a that is a tough one. Uh ah, man, you even sent me this question and I still haven't got an answer. I feel terrible. Um I love beetles. Beetles are pretty cool. Um, and I, I really, there's one beetle called the bombardier beetle. And it can spray toxic spray, hot toxic spray <laughs> out of its abdomen. I've always thought that would be a great superpower. Uh, if someone was annoying me, yeah. I could just spray them with some, some hot acerbic acid. That'll show them. Yeah, that will show them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
So I guess maybe, uh, you know, off the top of my head, that would be cool. Also a lightning bug. I would, I'd like to be able to glow at will. That would be fun. That would be. And I would have to choose a B. Like if I didn't, if I didn't take into account climate change and all that kind of whatnot that we're causing in, into this world, I think that bees, they're one of the very few insects, like bee or an ant, because they all work as a team mm. and they're all kind of in sync. So like they, they have- do. Right. That that is actually a great point. They they do have uh, a great coordinated society. Yeah, and we definitely, I definitely want that would be a nice change of pace for what's going on in the world right now. Oh, ooh, that was a zinger! All right, I love it. I'm right there with you, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining me, and I'm gonna go fly to my nest because I'm actually fly to my hive because I'm secretly a bee. Oh my gracious! <laughs> and. Just thank you so much for joining me. This has been a really fun interview. I've learned a lot, and I'm sure everybody else listening has learned a ton as well. Well, E-Train, it was a delight to be invited. And thank uh, you. you are one of the best interviewers I've ever talked to. Oh, thank you so much. It means a lot. And I'm just, <laughs> you're one of the best guests I've had. And I'm not just what? saying that. <laughs> yeah, I'm not uh, just saying that. Because I, I, like, science... Before this year, well, before this this school year, I didn't really have an interest in science. But now, like, like I'm loving science in school. Well, everybody, this has been another amazing day on E Train Talks, and I'm so lucky I have had the opportunity to talk with so many authors, so many talented authors like Dr. Jay Hosler. Thanks for tuning in and listening. And you remember, you need to check out Evolution: The Story of Life on Earth. The Way of the Hive, A Honeybee Story, and all of Jay Hauser's writing. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.